I'm just saying, you have often admitted like you were very antisocial in high school. Oh, it was because of religious. Yeah, he was like fundamentalist. Big oh. time. And he didn't think he could. Oh, yeah. I I used to ask God's forgiveness after every single lunch period because I didn't get the nerve to go around witnessing to people. Because I took wow. that verse that said, if you know the good things to do and, and you, you do not do it, that's sin. just as... Wow. It's sin. And so I I was in const I was in that mode constantly. I'm always doing or I'm always not doing enough. And so it was like I was I was locked in on a works based salvation. It explains and I did, a lot, doesn't it? It does. That's well I just wild. it explains. <laughs> <laughs> that is wild. What I'm is it? Saying, no, I'm joking about how you just, like I, I think I think what you were in high school and what, the way you used to be it affects a lot of what sure. you become as, as a adulthood. Form of grace yeah. You don't want to be that ever yeah. again. I mean, yeah. Or no. apply and it I'm to other I'm not saying people. you've swung the pendulum too far or anything. I'm just saying clearly, like, well. you're in a completely different place. <laughs> you're in a completely different place than then. And I'm sure it's because you don't like that. So right. You don't like you. Yeah. And I, and I feel like there has been seasons in my life where I've had to swing it hard because of how steeped in yeah. the law I yeah. was. Mm. Yeah. Maybe I've balanced out So the now. truth is, is, is... Welcome to Seacoast Podcast, everybody, by the way. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Just because I don't believe or agree doesn't mean I can't learn from you. Why did you have to bring that up? <laughs> okay, that one I'm super embarrassed about. <laughs> Do you like me? Do I like you? Yeah. As, a, as an individual or as yeah, a podcast? Yeah, as a person. No, I person. like you. Okay, cool. Yeah. cool. And I don't have any interest in appearing to be stronger than I am. I ain't bowed a Nebuchadnezzar statue. He gonna leave. You feel me? How do we love people who see the world differently than we do? What would it look like if we truly loved all of our neighbors? Could listening to their stories be the first step? This is Seacoast Church, and there's way more to talk about. <laughs> so the truth is, his lie that I bullied him is just not true. We just didn't associate. So... We just didn't hang out around each other. There's got to be very few people who really think that you bullied me. So, and then we didn't see each other until I walked into the West Ashley campus in 2007, and there was Joey on staff at West Ashley. And did you know who he was? Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm not convinced you even know who, knew who I was. 100% I did. All right. Absolutely. All right. Because yeah. we did not talk in high school. No, but I knew, but, but we knew who each other was. Yeah. Yeah. How big was your high school? Back I want to say our senior class, my guess would be 250, yeah, 300. so you would have yeah. known. High school at yeah. 1,200. Right. Yeah, so, yeah so. same thing for my high school, about three in our Were you in the popular car- crowd? You were popular. <laughs> <laughs> I was the drum major of the marching band, and I was in the drama club. That Does is, that answer your question? That is so funny. <laughs> I, I, You're I, popular in some, in one circle. <laughs> in one very small. No, depends on how big your band was. All right, so so as so as an adult, as an adult, would you take this as a uh, not nice statement for me to say? I would if I had to have guessed, and I could I can see band and drama, but if I had to have guessed, I would have guessed football cheerleading like into school spirit and that's not a bad guess i actually cheered until i got to high school and i had to make the choice because i couldn't do both um and it really was a toss-up i didn't make a like informed decision of like i wanted to do both and so i could have gone either way i could have stayed in the cheerleading or gone but i at the last minute i decided band and it changed the trajectory of my life Awesome. How long? How far did you play beyond high school? Yeah, I played through college. Did you? Yeah. What'd you play? Trombone. Come on. Wow. Yeah. Can you still play? I cannot. Oh I man. I have not played since senior year in in college, which was twenty twenty years ago. I say next time Lynn shows up in the studio, we have a trombone, a trombone. waiting. <laughs> just to see. <laughs> I played tuba until until I got to high school. I played in. in did you play an instrument? Uh, I. Signed up for band and I stayed in for two weeks and uh, <laughs> signed up yeah. before they assigned many, instruments. Too many, just, too many yeah, centers. I'm telling you, too I many just, centers in there. I didn't. It, well, that was probably part of it. <laughs> Some kid cussed next to me and I'm like, I can't take this class. Yeah. And you would have had to play like secular classical music, right? Right. right. Oh, y'all, y'all. It was it was bad. I thought to my. I mean, here's the thoughts in my head. I thought to myself, there's if. 
if I played basketball in college, I could not play for the Wake Forest Demon Deacons or the <laughs> or the Duke Blue Devils. I was like, that'd be a sin. I can't. Ma- I, that's how my mind would go. So it's awesome. No, it's not. That's the problem. It's not. I was under <laughs> under heavy religious oppression. Oh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> hey, so I I am really interested to hear and to share something. So yesterday was all staff. I tuned in online. Mm-hmm. Won't go into why. Uh, it's nobody's business. No, I wasn't feeling well. <laughs> had a really bad headache. I have got to know what y'all's experience was. I'll just tell our listeners that it seems as if coming from Lisa Surratt, God laid on her heart that everybody's going to really slow down Mm -hmm. and we're really going to seek the Lord and and prayer and extended worship and all of that. I've got to know what the feel was there because y'all and Obviously, this isn't a first time occurrence for me, but it's still, it's just it's such a beautiful thing. I had my computer open, and I'll even go so far as to admit that, you know, when you have your computer open and you're away from people and stuff, you can maybe, head, you know, go look at something and check your email real quick and kind of double task. It didn't matter <clears throat> if I was double tasking or concentrating, there was a continual edifying spirit yeah. that I yeah. that was palpable in my room in West Ashley yeah. at my yeah. house yeah. 30 miles away. It yeah. was unbelievable. Yeah. And, and it was so crazy too because there would be times when, and, and I believe in the spiritual things and I can understand people could say, well, this, you were just feeling this and it was a human thing, whatever. But it, it, it was almost like it didn't even matter whether I was like focused in on what y'all were doing, it, it felt like a feeling yeah. that I was like, yeah. wow, the spirit is just alive and awake with whatever's going on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. For sure. Go ahead. I mean, want, go ahead. I, it was, I mean, I felt the tangible presence of God in there. I mean, there were a part of the morning where I was like flat on my face, like bawling, praying into, I mean, like yeah. I just, that you know, like it just, I can't even, I can't really describe like just the feeling in there. And even at the very end, we had like prayer time with our tables and we, like when the worship team started singing lyrics, like we weren't ready to stop and we just kept on going. Um, So it was, uh, it was something that I needed yesterday that I didn't know that I needed. Um, Yeah, it was just. I don't, it was a sweet time. Mm-hmm. It was a sweet time. Yeah. Did you feel the same way? Oh, it was, it was incredibly special. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. It, it, it's, uh, was there a point in time when those sorts of environments were a little foreign and uneasy for you with your Baptist background? Cause you guys didn't do the whole, Hey, let's slow down today and just kind of rest and seek in the Holy spirit. I mean, y'all yeah. didn't do that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, no yeah. offense to Baptist, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully Jenny, our listeners out there are Baptists. Hope they didn't. Joey just didn't offend you. Oh, remember, I remember the list last week. Nobody getting offended when yeah, Joey wasn't. Yeah. yeah. No. Um, no, just kidding. Um, no, I, honestly, I don't know. I feel like I've been removed from that for so long. Yeah. I can't remember a time where I where I wasn't comfortable. Like, no, I, I can't remember being uncomfortable. I was never personally uncomfortable in that in that in that environment. When you hear uh, like some listeners picked up on it and I did too, did you when, see, you, she when she was, stopped? she almost said did speaking in tongues. Yeah. 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 That, I like when, when, <laughs> <laughs> when you, when you, when you hear that, do you think, gosh, that is so crazy. Like no. speaking like, or no, I don't. And it, is it because you've been at Seacoast for so long now that exposure to the spiritual things, but like, would you say early on when you first came on, that stuff was new, right? I mean, because you had never been in environments where people talked about the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and those sorts of things. Oh, no, I've, I had. I had. Certainly, Seacoast, um, I, I would say Seacoast was more than I than I probably ever. But no, it was never anything. Speak, the speaking in tongues thing has never been, uh, probably when I was really younger, you know, growing up. But as an adult in ministry, the speaking in tongues thing has never thrown me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not something that I have... Uh, it's not something that I have been given. Mm-hmm. I think it's a gift. Um, uh, personally, it's not something that I have, uh, you know, done, practiced, or, or been 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 blessed with. I'll say it that way. But I don't have any. It doesn't weird me out in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. So I yeah. think it's amazing. Yeah, I think that's what was special about yesterday. Um, 
there wasn't a formula and they weren't leading us to do anything. Right. And so it's like the presence of the yeah. Lord was in the room and everybody was just responding to him. Yeah. In whatever way. Some yeah. people were walking around. Some people were journaling. Some people were singing. Some people were praying with each other. Um, Cause I, the, or like, I think the first part of that time I was like at my table and then I just felt compelled to get up and then yeah. I felt compelled to be on my knees and then compelled to be on my face. And so it was just yeah. like, I don't think we were really paying attention to each other, sure. except that we were all there for him. Yeah. And yeah. so. Yeah. I See, spent my, a lot my, of the time sitting down, honestly, just, just, just taking it in, not mm-hmm. even like actively singing along and worshiping with it, which, which is, which is the normally for me, mm-hmm. like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I love worship, fully engaged in worship. But for me yesterday, I did, I just did a lot of sitting yeah. and just, just yeah. taking in the moment and for listening me, to the words. Yeah. And for me and my Pentecostal background, I've always been like, oh, Seacoast is so tame. We didn't, the pastor, <laughs> the pastor didn't ask us all to march around the church building like Jericho. <laughs> that was a tame Sunday. <laughs> Nobody ran around the church yelling. Very much but so. But you tame. didn't grow up in that, did yes, you? Yes, I did, dude. Where? First assembly of God, or I'll say assemblies of God. I won't pinpoint a church. And then church of God. Those are my two backgrounds. Church of God, assemblies of God. I, okay. For I was Catholic reason, through the third grade. Well, that's okay. That's what I was saying. I knew you had a, ca- a Catholic upbringing at one point in time. Right. I'll tell you all this. When I was in college, I was I was pretty, uh, I, I don't think in a abrasive or annoying way, but I guess I'm not the person to judge, but I was pretty outspoken about my faith and people knew that I had you know, Christian beliefs and stuff. And I'll never forget, there was a coworker of mine, we were both RAs, resident assistants. And he told me, and he was very serious. He said, hey man, uh, I don't believe in God. He was like, but I have to admit, there's been a couple of times where I've been in churches where y'all are doing like spiritual stuff, like just spiritual stuff going on. And I would say most people in his shoes would then say, and it was weird and it freaked me out. And he literally was just like, I, there was something about it that I cannot shake. Yeah. Mm, he said sure. that I felt something and I don't know, I don't have an explanation for it, but for him, it was that there was a valid spiritual experiment Absolutely. that I don't yeah. have words for. 100%. And I, and, and as a, as a young college Christian kid, I was like, Whoa, that's unbelievable. Yeah. You know, yeah. This guy doesn't even believe. And he walked into a building and felt yeah. the spirit. Yeah. 100%. All right. So last week people heard us talk about the Billy Graham rule. And uh, last weekend, I uh, disobeyed the Billy Graham rule, and I want to ask you guys what y'all think. Whoa! That's not why Joey wasn't on the episode before. <laughs> I wasn't sat down <laughs> by my superiors. No, but here's, here's all right. So there is a precious man from the. Uh, we go way back James Allen campus, and he is he's having kind of a tragic bout with cancer. And I say that because it, it feels like outside of a miracle, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, this isn't going to end well. And y'all, a lot of people know that I had a seizure in November, so I can't drive. So I'm already li- I mean, I, I always try, I'm rounding up my rides and asking my daughter if she can pick me up. And I've, I've had two college friends drive all the way to West Ashley just to pick me up and bring me to work. Yeah. And, um, so I, you know, having issues with transportation, and all of this, well, there is, uh, so this guy is an elder of the church and there's a different elder of the church. We're talking over 80 years old. So, so elderly. Oh, yes. Uh, don't talk about <laughs> Maddie like that. Uh, but she's, she's older <clears throat> than my mom. She's good friends with my mom. This is the context that I have her in. Yeah. Technically, I should have said, uh, I can't visit Rick, even though you want to swing by the house and pick me up and take me. It was a perfect Saturday. Priscilla is traveling with my son for extracurricular activities. I can't drive. He's just getting to a place where he's having visitors. I have an opportunity for Maddie to come by, pick me up just the two of us in the car and go, she's over 80 years old, in my opinion. And I, you know, there's a part of me that's just like, I mean, should I call somebody? I feel like if I was like, Hey, ma'am, my mom's friend, I can't ride in the car with you because of Billy Graham rule. That is, I think an example (laughs) of when we're taking the law 
and just making it something that it doesn't need to be. It's a protective measure. And I'm not attracted to people in my mom's generation. I guess maybe some people would, but there's not, that's just, I love this lady. I look up to her. I love her. There's, I broke the rule though, right? Well, yeah, but I don't, yeah. You wouldn't care. I'm with you. I'm with you completely. Um, but yeah, I think we've got to use, yeah, there's, there, we've got to use discretion, I think. I mean, you know, um, I think we can all fool ourselves into uh, crossing, uh, we can all fool ourselves into crossing lines unnecessarily, I guess, you know, but there has to be a point where we say clearly this wasn't the intent of the, of the rule. And I think in that case, it, it, it's similar. I would have done the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Another example. <laughs> Both would you have would would you have done it? I don't know. Well, part of this is I am very much a rule follower. <laughs> Me too. Me too. And so I um I I may have said I'm not able to go today. Or, you know, like I may not have have done it because my thing is I see what you're saying it's the heart of the law and the letter of the law right you can follow the letter of the law and it not be in your heart you can follow the heart of the law the letter of the law and miss the heart of it like you know like healing someone on the sabbath is a perfect example right like it's you're not supposed to work on the sabbath but why wouldn't you heal someone um so I guess you just have to like from a broader perspective think about you know, what am I, you know, what am I doing? Are there situations where that could be called in the question by somebody else? You know, if it were um, an older woman in the congregation that you didn't have a relationship with, who wasn't like a mom to you, who didn't know your mom, could there be, you know, like it's all, it's all nuanced. And so I don't know, you have to make a decision of like, am I going to draw this hard line and not, Mm. you know, not do it at all or but mm-hmm. I don't have a emotion. I don't have any sort of response to it. Y'all know the verse that says, avoid the very appearance of evil. Yep. I was taught that that meant that if you're doing something and it looks like you may be up to no good, then don't do it because it appears to be no good. I, if I'm not mistaken, what that verse actually means is, you know, imagine looking in front of you down the road and you're like, whoa. That appears to be an evil situation. It says avoid it. Even if it appears evil, you know, we should have such an aversion to evil that we're like, it appears evil, not even going to go over there. I think that's what it's saying. It's not saying, hey, be careful what you're doing, you know, as far as making. The reason why I bring that up is my sister, both of y'all know who Crystal is. You know Crystal well. There would be times when it was just her and I in the car And I would say that would be another one. That is not the Billy Graham rule. I'm not related to her. So somebody could say, well, who's to say that you wouldn't start liking your sister? Whereas, I mean, that's my, that's my little sister. I've had people at Seacoast say, yeah, but that's your, that's your sister. And it's like, I agree. But what if there was a situation like, it it just seems like we're kind of just uh, picking and choosing how we yeah. want to do this. How would you feel about me? You know, she's younger than me. Uh, if somebody doesn't know who she is, they're like, oh, Pastor Joey, that's not Priscilla. Who is that girl? Yeah. I think, and I'd have to like go back and look at all of the context around that scripture. But I think some of it is guarding the appear, like what you're stepping into, but also shepherding the influence that you have. Um, and so that doesn't mean that I'd make my decisions on like, what do I think people are going to think about me if I do this? But if there, if something could be called into question, um, is it p- beneficial to do that yeah. thing? Yeah, and yeah. so I think that's where, where it comes down to, like, could it be called into question? Um, and is that, and do you do things that are inconvenient so that there isn't any question, Ooh, right? Okay. And yeah. so that's the question. Like, it's not convenient, but yeah. are we living abo- above reproach? Well, I was going to say, it's the above reproach thing too, right? Like, as leaders. <laughs> I'm just, I, I can't, like, y'all are my friends, and I'm just going to come right out and say, I'm going to back y'all into a corner in a second. You are? I'm about to have a mic drop. Moment. You are? Yeah. Okay. All with right. both of what y'all are saying. With, with no Bring pri- it. With All no right. pride, complete Bring humility, it. he's going to mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> you know you struggle with pride when you're like, I'm, what I'm going to say is, about is to a mic drop. <laughs> we'll be the judge of that. <laughs> All right, listen, listen. 
above reproach, calling into question, but we read, huh, look, he's hanging with the drunkards. He's hanging with the prostitutes. Look, he's eating and drinking. He must be a glutton. He must be a drunkard. Was he eating and drinking with them alone? You know, you do see... Well, I'm not talking Billy Graham rule here. I'm but just that, saying... But that's, you know. the, but that's the point. There's a difference between Pharisees who are looking for a reason to say, you're not who you say you are. You're you're sinning. And then there's a difference of like what the the spirit of the Billy Graham rule is... Is And so when you think about that, I don't think you can apply like, well, people said that Jesus was a glutton and a drunkard and a sinner because he was eating with gluttons and drunkards and sinners. Um, I don't think that's the same thing. I think it's, uh, you know, if 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 he were all the women in his company, if we had scripture that was like, oh, Jesus was off with women by himself. I think people would have been like, why are you? You know, it's even a big deal that he's like at the well yeah. <laughs> with the woman, yeah. you know. And so I think that they're just you, uh, taking that verse to apply it to other things to saying like, well, because people thought something about Jesus, people are always going to think the wrong thing about us means that we don't have to then hold ourselves to a higher standard and draw some hard lines that are uncomfortable. I don't think that's a good interpretation of that yeah. scripture. I think specifically as it relates to like the 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 the, the male female thing, which you keep for, referring to as the Billy Graham thing. Um, it, you know, the reason I don't the reason I don't cross those lines is um, uh, you have a valid point about, uh, but I, I feel like there's two different things here. You have a valid point about Jesus hanging out with people, but Jesus was Jesus. He was sinless. He he was not. He was. There's, there's no way that Jesus crosses those lines. Mm. I don't trust myself in my human flesh to not be tempted to cross lines that I shouldn't cross if I end up in a, in a situation where it would be easy for me to cross those lines. So the best way I know how to set myself up for success is to not put myself in positions where I would be tempted to cross lines that clearly I shouldn't cross. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Jesus didn't have the same struggles that I had in terms of— You said he did not? No, he didn't. I mean, but I've heard theology that says the complete opposite, that he— he was tempted and struggled and yet was without sin. And I, that, I think that is, that, is the, that is such a tough theological question that we can't get into. But <laughs> did Jesus have the capacity to actually sin, which would mean what we believe about the atonement? If he did, we are all condemned yeah. for eternity of hell. That's what that would mean. And I, that's it's so interesting. Could yeah. he have messed up? I think that's a great theological question. My 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 take on it would simply be this: that Jesus possessed in the the perfect, complete willpower to always say no to sin. A power that you and I do not possess. Right. And in my flesh, I don't have the ability to completely say no to sin. If if I could, I I'd be perfect like Jesus. Yeah. And that's what differentiates me and you from from him. Right. And the just even thinking about the, you know, he, on the cross, he condemned sin, which is in our flesh because of Adam, but it's not in his flesh. So it's just a, mm-hmm. it's just a different thing. He had the power to say yes, but he would, like you said, he would, I don't think he would have ever done that. Yeah. yeah. It's, and, and, and my, it goes back to the fully man, fully God dichotomy. I hope people realize when you say fully man, fully God, I, I ascribe to that as well, but let's remember that does not make sense. That's the best we can put words to Absolutely. it because if yeah. you're fully man, you're going to mess up. Absolutely. If you're fully God, you're not. So for for me, I always lean towards, yeah, but yeah, but he's fully God, so everything's fine. But then it's like, well, then he couldn't have been fully yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I I, th- I think that uh, that's the best words, just like the Trinity. That's the best that's thing absolutely. that we can come up with, yep. but our, our minds just can't grasp it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Lynn, if I got up and went 
to use the restroom, would you feel like you'd have to leave the room because of the Billy Graham rule with Roy well, that you would well, have to JT's leave the room? in the sound booth. Oh, so. yeah. So you're good. But what if and we, we had JT cameras, left? And we've got, we've got, <laughs> and we've got cameras, cameras <laughs> and we've got glass doors for that there very reason. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Shay, welcome to the podcast. It's good to have you. I, you guys have already met Jack and Shay, and Shay, it's it's Houdman, Houdman, Hoodman, Hoodman, Shay yeah. Hoodman. I like it. I like. Where's that? Where's that last name from? Is that German? It's it's German, but um, like many American last names, it was originally something else, and it just got changed over the generations. I've heard it was originally like Houtman. Yeah, Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Ein bisschen. Ein bisschen. Uh, mich auch. Ich spreche Deutsch, aber nicht so gut. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, yeah. Jack, you impressed? Come uh, on, Jack. <laughs> like, ich, ich habe drei Jahre Deutsch gelernt, aber ich habe das meiste vergessen. Yeah, ja, ich habe fünf Jahre lernen. Uh, yeah. I don't remember how to say high school. I would probably say Hochschule <laughs> yeah, and then Universität. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, we, I've been looking forward to this conversation. So for our listeners sake, you, you guys, uh, I don't know. What should I say? You guys, when, when, when it comes to gutquestions.org and the book, the hundred most asked questions about God and the Bible, is this all you or do you have a team or what, what's going on here? Tell us a little bit. I would love for you to refer to got questions in the plural because it's definitely way more than just me. I mean, we've got a team of 12 employees. And while my name is the um, listed as the author of the book, I don't even know how many of the articles in the book I wrote. It's definitely a, a team effort. But um, Bethany wouldn't allow us to put like 17 names on the um, title on the cover of the book as the author. So it had to be me. Right. Right, yeah. I hear you. So here's what here's what I would love to do is uh, obviously I want to hear a little bit more about your work and just you know questions such as how how do you know these are the hundred most asked questions and I know you've got good answers with all this and just the the research you've done. Eight, did I read correctly? Eighteen million monthly visitors to the website. That's correct. Dang. And and how long has the website been going on? We just had our 22nd birthday. Dang. Man, that's incredible. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, so I'd love to talk a little bit also about the the nature of belief, and I'm curious some of Jack's thoughts on that too. And then what I thought we would do is end, end things by just tackling five of those hundred questions, uh, and I, you know, just cherry pick some of them. But how did you? I mean, how how'd you arrive at at even starting this? So 22 years ago, what got in your head to where you're just like, yeah, I'm going to do a website and devote my the rest of my life on reading books and theology and helping people with questions. Um, so uh, try to give you the long story short version. Um, graduated from Bible college and seminary and really didn't feel a clear calling from God into any of the quote unquote traditional forms of ministry. I mean, I'm much better writer than I am a public speaker. I joke that I don't like teenagers. So that eliminates youth ministry. (laughs) Um, I have no musical talent whatsoever. So um, there goes all those things. So it was like, God, I've committed my life to you and I, I want to serve you, but none of the traditional church type ministries seem to be a really good fit. Um, it was late 2001, early 2002. The internet was really getting to be something that most people had in their homes. High-speed internet was becoming more prevalent, so you could actually do something productive online without waiting half an hour for a picture to download. So <laughs> my wife and I were just praying, like, Lord, what would be the unique, perfect ministry fit for us? Um, so we launched GotQuestions.org in February of 2002, truly thinking this will be some fun little hobby we do in addition to whatever quote unquote real ministry God calls us to little we know this was the real ministry God was calling us to. And so the last 22 years is watching God take what we thought would be a hobby and just exploding it into one of the most um, frequently visited Christian websites in the world. And really it's the 
the power of questions. Everyone loves asking questions and the anonymity of the internet that we don't know them, they don't know us, really opens their hearts to answer, to ask us the questions that they have. And so 22 years later, hundreds of thousands of questions and now millions of website visitors each month. Um, God has truly done some amazing things far beyond anything we could ask or imagine. That's cool, man. Hey, that's our, that's our theme verse around here. Ephesians 3.20. There you go. Yeah, we, we end every service with that verse. Hey, is the... Uh, so... Uh, the, I love the snapshot picture of the website. Now, how about this book? And I would imagine that the website is pretty interactive with people submitting questions and all that, and that probably helped birth this book. But who came up with the idea for, hey, let's write a book on the 100 most asked questions? And then how did you find out that these are the 100 most asked questions? Did you just survey people for a while, or is this you know, all of your records through the last 22 years, or what? Sure. So to your first question, um, Bethany House Publishers actually contacted us. I think one of their uh, book agents there um, had been a, a fan of GotQuestions.org. I've been using it for years. And it's like, I wonder if they've ever thought about doing a book. So they actually approached us and asked, hey, um, would you be as interested in publishing a book with us? So we started going down that road. We self-published a few books several years ago, and but really without a publisher behind you to help promote the book and get the word out, um, it really didn't go much of anywhere. So having a publisher like Bethany behind us really encouraged us to be willing to do it again. And just through back and forth conversations, we decided to go with, well, let's do a book, the top 100 questions that we received in our 22-year history. So um, how did we come up with that list? It's a combination of the actual questions people have submitted to us, the people who have gone to the website submitted a question. We keep track of all of those and we can categorize them. And then it's also it's that with it's our website traffic. And we've got over 9,000 frequently asked questions, articles on the website. And so when people um, search on Google, land on one of these things, we can see which are the most popular pages. And those would then be the questions that people are asking most often. So it's a combination of both those things, both the personal submitted and just the internet searches and our internal search engine um, we use to try to determine. These are what we're thinking in our experience, again, with hundreds of thousands of questions, millions of visitors are the questions that are most common, most popular. Well, that's cool, man. Congrats on the on the 20 plus years of ministry, this book and and all of that, man. This is great to have you on here. I'd love to ask both of y'all just some general questions about belief. And I, I wanted to tell you up front too, uh, Shay, that pl- none of these questions are uh, in any way like antagonistic to faith or answers or anything. If they sound that way, ignore that. I just want to get to a deeper level of, of belief and, you know, a certainty, the goal. The reason why I say that is I do think personally that the the church doesn't do the best job all the time with allowing questions. It's almost mm-hmm. like there's certain questions that are on the table, but if someone starts asking questions that don't need to be on the table, instead of welcoming that conversation, we kind of say, oh, we got to draw a line there. And then we move that person out of the way where let's just face it. There's, there's going to be times when people in the church start asking questions that maybe we would be, see as, Oh, that's kind of dangerous stuff. But the, the worst thing we could do is say, okay, so we're not going to talk about that stuff. You need to you know stand off to the side. So mm-hmm. I, I'm going to ask both of y'all can, can one ever be too focused on answers when it comes to the spiritual things? What do you think, Jack? Well, uh, you know, I guess I I kind of sit in the, um, you know, we see as through a glass darkly camp on, on some of these things. Um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's good to make sure that we're always seeking to draw closer to God and to understand God better. Our ability to do that is limited. We know that. And yet that doesn't mean that the quest isn't worthwhile because, as we seek after God, I think the scriptures tell us that he enables us to find him. And and as we do, he has the power to change us. Now, you know, I would also say, you know, there are some questions are more fruitful 
than others. You know, Paul has a lot of things to say about, you know, to like the young pastor, Timothy, about, you know, hey, be careful about people who are always just going after foolish controversies. And, you know, he says, he makes the comment that, you know, these guys who think they know don't know as they ought to know. And um, so, you know, there's a balance. It's like, I I, I think that, um, in my mind, you know, the, the scriptures want us to have knowledge so that it can inform our lives for fruitful living. And that knowledge is first and foremost knowledge of God. So, uh, now, you know, are there any questions that are out of bounds? Like, why would there be? Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking, Shay, is uh, I, I don't know how much you know about your audience, but, you know, one of the things I'm curious about are, you know, what what, what portion of your audience are non-believers trying to, you know, come to grips with what the Bible is about versus maybe believers who are trying to understand um, how the Bible, what the Bible teaches about certain areas that where they have questions or where there are where where we've got cultural conflicts. Oh, Jack, that's a great question and well said in your first part. Was, it got questions we truly wish. We get more questions on um, how can I know for sure I'd go to heaven when I die or how can I grow as a Christian or how can I understand God's word more? Because we do get a lot of questions that are about the peripherals where it's just like, uh, who are the sons of God and daughters of men in Genesis chapter six? What what were the Nephilim? What, when exactly is this event in the end times going to happen versus this one? And these are fascinating, interesting to study. And if it's in God's word, it's important and worth discussing, but a lot of people really want to laser focus on their hobby horse issue rather than what's truly important. So now I, I get that, that uh, some questions are far more important and valuable and edifying than others. Um, regarding our audience, um, we can collect some data from just our search engine at analytics. Um, we use Google Analytics for that, and it can tell us a lot about people, but only what only those who volunteer that information. We have a um, if someone submits a question, we ask them to give us some basic demographic info and have another survey that asks the same thing. So we can get a pretty good feel for it. Um, I'd say the vast majority of our website visitors are Christians, but I would say um, newer Christians or even um, Christians who aren't yet mature in their faith, because you can tell just by the type of questions people are asking. Um of some of very mature believers who will ask some of the more difficult, deeper theological questions and then questions from unbelievers. I mean, we true generally do receive questions on how can I know for sure I go to heaven when I die or what does it mean to trust in Christ as your personal savior? So those are obviously people who either don't understand the gospel or are trying to confirm their understanding of the gospel. So we anything and everything, anyone and everyone asks us questions, anything from the hardened critic to the longtime believer who's um, struggling with something. But the vast majority, I'd say, are in the believers of the younger or more immature in their faith mm-hmm. would be my answer to that. But again, wide range. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, is the is the posture of the book, it, uh, d- describe it for me. Is it is it like, hey, read this if you want the answers? Is it hey, read this and we'll give you a variety of answers and then we'll tell you what we think? Like, is it open-handed? Is it authoritative? And maybe maybe we can use the question as an example. One of the questions that you answer is, will we remember our earthly lives when we are in heaven? So how would you answer that question from an authoritative or open-handed perspective? Because we sure <laughs> as heck don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, Joey, that, I mean, that's... It's a great question, both the actual question of remembering our earthly lives in heaven, and then also how do we answer the questions? And so, so Joey, if I was attending Seek Coast Church and walked up to you and said, hey, Pastor Joey, um, I, I don't understand this Bible verse. Can you tell me what it means? I wouldn't be asking you, so Joey, tell me the 10 interpretations of this verse and then just let me go figure it out on my own. No, I'm asking you as a friend, it's like, Hey, could you explain this to me? Tell me what you think the right interpretation is. And that's generally how we approach things with our answers that got questions. And sometimes we'll say, no, here are the three views that we think are 
biblically plausible, and here's the one we prefer and why. But other times, we'll just say, here's the one we prefer and why, because we don't want to add confusion to something that's a difficult issue. But even when we're doing that, we try to do it in the spirit of we're not claiming this is the only answer. We're not claiming that anyone who disagrees with us is a bad Christian or anything. It's like, no, we're just, if, if you're asking us which view do we think is right, here's um, here's the one we think is right. Um, specifically to the remembering our earthly lives um, in heaven, like you said, I don't know that there's a concrete answer. There's off the top of my head, I know there's a verse in Isaiah that seems to indicate that we will remember, won't remember certain things. But if you were to just look at yourself, I mean, if all your memories were erased, would in what sense would you still be you? So I would say, I think in heaven, we will have memories of our earthly lives, who we are, and so forth. But those memories will be Redeem those memories will be cleansed. The memories will be accurate, and what will be free from um, our presuppositions and the way we're misinterpreting those memories. So it'll be our memories, but perfected. I think is the general gist of that answer we give. Because I, I just don't see how we could anyway actually still be ourselves if our entire memories of our earthly existence were erased when we arrived in heaven. Yeah, I like it. I'll sign up for that kind of redemption of all memories and all of that. Let me ask both of y'all, and I'll tell you why I'm asking this question. It's, I think that we have to come to grips with the fact that there's tons of Christians approaching the Bible for answers and uh, millions of Christians come out with one answer millions of Christians come up with something completely different. So I'll say that I personally believe that there there is a a absolute truth that the Bible is like I think what would you say about the Bible before that it's 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 perfect in what it's trying to do something like that have you Yeah, well one we, Shay one of the things that we've we've had done some podcasts before and I and uh, we've had this question of Different theological issues come up, and one of the things that you come down to is you know the question of inerrancy, and 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 one of the things I've said, and I think this is what you're referring to, is that I believe everything that the Bible affirms about itself, and you know, so that can be a useful test in terms of, for me at least, in terms of uh, you know some of the theological assumptions that we make. If you're telling me that the Bible says this, but really what you're doing is you're making an inference. And the Bible never affirms that that it speaks to that kind of an issue. Then you know there's at least some question as to whether your inference is mm-hmm. uh, valid. Yeah, yeah. And I, let me read this. This is uh, something uh, about. This is like a, a lauding of your book. It is not our purpose. What's well, coming from? I guess y'all's promo. It's not our purpose to make readers agree with us, but rather to point them to what the Bible says concerning their questions. Readers can be assured that their questions will be answered by a trained and dedicated Christian who loves the Lord and desires to assist them in their walk with Him. Uh, there, I guess the reason why I laid that foundation is because this could maybe come across as the whole truth being fluid and your truth and my truth, and we can all have different truths. I don't agree with that. But I do think when we say, hey, we're going to point people to what the Bible says, would we all agree that what we're really saying is our interpretation, our personal interpretation, because Christians are so differing in their beliefs? Well, well one comment, though, if you point people what the Bible says and you're quoting it, I mean, that, that to me is a big aspect of this. And uh, it, it's not a matter if, right. if you point people to what the Bible says and you never quote the scripture itself, sure. I think that's a problem. Right. If what you pointing people to what the Bible says points them to the verses that you think bear on their question, I don't think that that's how could that be inappropriate? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So maybe a better question would be not not what the Bible says, but what the Bible teaches by what it says. Anyway, what do you think, Shay? You, you get where where I'm coming from? I, I do for sure. Um, I think you will, if you go through this book and definitely if you go through the website, you'll detect a different approach when we address something the Bible explicitly says. Like, for example, the question, is Jesus the only way? Well, I can point you to multiple 
passage where Jesus himself and other uh, the apostles explicitly say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, like John 14, 6. So on that question, we're going to answer, we're going to be pretty dogmatic. No, the Bible teaches that Jesus is the only way to salvation. But on one, like the one you mentioned earlier, the will you remember our earthly lives? I don't know that the Bible explicitly teaches this, so we have to draw on principles from Scripture. I mean, there are a few Scriptures that seem to um, indicate that people have some sort of memories in heaven, so you can go to those, but you can't teach answer that question with the same degree of specificity that you do the ones the Bible directly addresses and there's clear and distinct teaching on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing I was thinking, Shay, I, I, you know, as I went to your website and read a number of the questions and answers, um, my sense is that a lot of the questions that you get, uh, it seems like a lot of the hundred most asked questions focus more on application than theology. What are Christians mm-hmm. supposed to do with this question? Whether it's, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, gay marriage, for example, or some of these other things that are very controversial topics, but they're really mm-hmm. applica- application questions rather than theologically specific questions. Like, I, I bet you don't get a lot of questions about dispensationalism. We don't. I mean, a few here and there in, in times, which of course is a significant part of dispensationalism, yep. is a very popular area of questions. But no, if you look at even like our top twenty questions on the on the website, um, most of them are like hot cultural issues, stuff that you're dealing with yeah. personally in your life. It's those type of like, practical where the rubber hits the road type of questions are definitely most often the most popular. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, so another little belief question. I My guess would be, and you guys push back if I'm wrong, but my guess would be that the three of us, if, if, if someone said, hey, personally, Shay, or personally, Jack, personally, Joey, how much do you believe all this stuff is true? Like, how, how much do you believe that God is God exists and Jesus rose and Jesus is God? I'd say, I'm gosh, I'm, I'm hovering around 99.9%. Because of my experiences, be, you know, just because of decades of of searching, if a if an unbeliever or someone who does not ascribe to the Christian faith, however, asks me questions about my faith, I'm I'm going to be okay with saying about any of my statements, but. I'm not sure. I'm fine with saying that to anyone. Hey, here's what I strongly believe, but I could be wrong. And 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 the the whole thing there is the supernatural realm is not something that we can prove to anyone. It's not something that we can point evidence to. So how should we as Christians, and this this is more personal opinion, but how should we carry ourselves when it comes to deeply embedded beliefs we have in conversations with folks who don't believe any of the Christian faith. Yeah. Is it okay to say, but I'm not sure, or does that sound weak? Yeah. You look at, okay, the, maybe the core question, like, let's go to, does God exist? If God doesn't exist, then, I mean, there's no point in anything that we're talking about right now. Um, Hebrews 11 talks about, but basically by faith, we must, believe that he God exists. So if even the most basic essential of the Christian faith, the existence of God, cannot be explicitly proven, that must be accepted by faith, then I think, yeah, I think you're right. We do need to express not a a doubt as much as like uncertainty on a lot of these things that based on my study of scripture, based on my experience of walking with Christ, based on my, the counsel I received from others, the teaching of pastors and so forth, I am extremely confident that this is true, and here's why. But to say, no, I, ultimately, I accept Christ by faith. I accept God's existence by faith. I accept the truths of the Bible by faith, because I cannot explicitly prove any of them. I think that's a healthy attitude for us to have. So it, I'll, I'll just ask, I'll ask you from a different perspective. So, so how, how, much, how much do you believe? Are you sure? Are you sure, Shay, about your faith? How would you answer can, that? You sure, man? Like, can, how much do you can know? I, <laughs> can, can I add an extra 
nine to the end of your 99.99. There you go. And I'm 99.999% sure. But no, I think I, I don't have doubt. I truly, I, I don't. I mean, God has done such an amazing work in my life and I've seen him work in transforming lives of others. I've seen God's word confirmed over and over and over again, proven itself true. Um, that I, I truly don't have doubt, but at the same time, I have a healthy level of maybe, maybe humility is more the word I'm looking for. And that I don't, as much as I, I, I think I'm right on these issues, I wouldn't be writing and publishing answers for the world to see if I didn't think I was right. But I try to do it with that of humility and saying that I, I could be wrong. I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes in the past. Some answers have changed significantly over the years as hopefully I've matured and the ministry has matured and due to the input, input and feedback from others. But in terms of doubt, I, I, I don't have doubt. Yeah. So, Jack, you're in a subway and you're wearing your Christian T-shirt. <laughs> Because you always wear Christian wear, right? <laughs> uh, sea coasters will get a chuckle out of that one. But somebody says, Jack, do you know for sure that Jesus is Lord? How do you answer that? As I say, I would say that I know it as surely as I can know anything. There's there's always some limit to our ability to know definitively as, you know, finite creatures. But Yeah. Yeah. What role does mystery play in y'all's personal faiths? <laughs> You know, for me, I, I think it gets back to what Shay was talking about, which is the posture of humility. I mean, I, I think if if the knowledge that you gain about the Scripture does not produce humility, then you've got to question whether you're really knowing as you ought to know. Uh, you know, the more that I learn, the more I'm aware of all that I don't know, and um and yeah, like I said, though that doesn't mean that the quest for learning isn't valuable because it 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 it, it shapes us, and um, we need to be shaped um, by the Spirit's work in our lives. So uh, I don't know yeah. if that answers your question, but yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's move on to four out of the hundred questions. First one being, can a Christian lose salvation? Shay, how do you address that in the book? Yeah, so. This one's definitely on our top 20, and this is the one that is definitely has a theological bent to it. Um, I mean, it is our conviction at GotQuestions.org that salvation is eternal secure, eternally secure, that once saved, always saved, that God preserves um, those who believe. Um, like in Jude, where it says, to him who is able to keep you from falling, presents you faultless before his majesty. Um, I just see so many passages in Scripture that talk about Nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing can sep- pry us from God's hand. Um, there's no condemnation that the life that he gives us is eternal. How could it have been eternal if it was can be taken away? All those things gives me the conviction that I believe in eternal security because I believe the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross was so perfect, so complete, that nothing we can do could cause it to be taken away. At the, uh, with that said, I understand that there are many believers who disagree strongly on this issue. Trust me, we've heard from many of them over the past 20 years, and I don't question their their faith. And I do recognize there's passages in Hebrews that talk about apostasy and other places that seem to indicate that if someone um, denies Christ, that they could lose salvation. And how we kind of come down to it is that I think we would both agree that if someone is living in hard-hearted rebellion against Christ, is denying the faith, is no longer believing, that person is not saved. So the question is, were they saved and lost it, or were they never saved to begin with? Well, we would land on never saved to begin with. Others would land on saved and lost it. But ultimately, the solution of that person, that person needs the gospel. So rather than fighting about what causes them, what their previous status was, Let's deal with the person where they're at now. Um, the person needs the gospel. The person needs to understand um, what, that Jesus died for them and needs to trust in Christ. So that's kind of the approach we take. But no, it got questions. We firmly believe that salvation is eternally secure. Mm. Yeah. What do you think, Jack? Well, I, 
You know, I would say I probably I, that's what, that would be the answer I come down on. I think the the way that you expressed it is actually kind of is pretty fair. And I, you know, one of the things I would say, Shay, is that you know some of the answers to questions that I read on your site dealing with areas of real areas where Christians really disagree. I think you do a nice job of. Um, presenting both sides, you know, presenting the, here's the contra argument, but here's why we believe what we believe, which mm-hmm. I think is always, is more than fair. Um, you know, and, I, and, and you know, you, somebody could always go in and say, well, you could have said more here. But again, I, I, you know, the sense I have is that you're trying in good faith to communicate accurately to people who have questions. And that's what this is all about. I, um, you know, I, I, I just, I do think that there are issues and that's one where, there are some verses that that can be interpreted differently, and mm-hmm. so, and and you know the 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 kind of like the balance of the biblical argument, um, I think is the way to lean, but it's not as it's not as satisfying as when you can look at something and think yes, the scripture is really definitive about this mm-hmm. one, and mm-hmm. uh, and yet you know I look at something like this you know can you lose your eternal salvation? What you're really trying to do. To, to me, the, the key issue there is someone who's fearful. They've accepted Christ. They're believers, but they're, but they're conscious of their unbelief. And so, uh, can, can God shelter that person? I believe absolutely. Can we know about that person over there and, and whether they were ever saved or not? No, we can't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well cool. said. All right. My, Y'all, y'all have heard of Chuck E. Cheese. If you're really old school, Showbiz Pizza, Billy Bob, you know, way before Chuck E. Cheese were old school. I remember going as a five year old, and my dad told me. So obviously, my dad didn't tell me this when I was a little kid, but he told me as I was as I was an adult. He was watching me and my brother play a video game, and he said, "To this day, he's like, I don't know why I said this." He said, "I I, I never used this phrase in this context." But he remembers uh, watching us playing, and then something happened on the video game, and he was like, holy ghost. And my dad was a young Christian at the time, and for a good little stint, he was plagued with the unpardonable sin. Like, he thought, man, I think I blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Like I said, holy ghost, flippantly, in vain, and uh, was plagued with fear for a really long time. So I'm curious what you guys think is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I've heard Tons of different perspectives, but I want to hear y'all's. So, Jack, you want me to go first, or you want to take Please. this one first? Yeah. And this is one of the questions that you guys address in your book, correct? Yes, yep. it is. Um, and like Jack was saying earlier with um, the lose your salvation question, often people come to us and when they ask this question, they are exactly like your father was. They've done something and they are worried Oh no, did I commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Not only have I lost my salvation, but now I actually can't get it back. I mean, that's the one sin that God won't forgive. Um, if you look at the actual passage in the Gospels, um, the Pharisees witnessed Jesus perform a miracle and then attribute that miracle to the power of Satan. Basically, he said, You've done this miracle in the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus says, um, you can you can sin against me all you want, but when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit like this, this is a unpardonable sin. Um, so, what was it they actually did? They attributed the power of the Holy Spirit to be the power of demons. Why was it such a big deal? Was it really th- them just doing that that one time, or was it the buildup that they had been rejecting Jesus, rejecting Jesus, rejecting all the clear signs that He was the Messiah? Hard, hard rebellion, continuing to deny him and thereby the Father again and again and again to the point that they could actually witness a clear miracle of God. And rather than repent and believe in Christ, they go to the extreme and say, Well, you're only doing that, you're doing that in the power of Satan, basically. So was it actually the act or was it all that would have had to happen in a person to lead up the act? If you get to that point in your relationship with God, that you're going to reject him despite the clearest evidence possible. Basically, God's saying, I'm done with you. I'm no longer going to call you, work in your life. You, I'm done giving you chances. 
So I would tend to think of it's not just a one-time thing. It's a it's a lifetime of rebellion, hard-hearted heresy against God that could lead you to do something like that. Because if a person doesn't know what they're doing, doesn't know anything about who Christ is and just says the words, I, I think Jesus performed miracles in the power of Satan. Is that really the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or is it the heart that's behind it? And so that's the direction we tend to go. Um, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit would be witnessing Christ perform a miracle and attributing that, the power of that miracle to Satan rather than the Holy Spirit. Mm. You pondered this one, Jack? Uh, probably, probably not as deeply. But I, you know, to me, some of the way that people look at this is there was a Far Side commercial or Far Side cartoon where you know I think the caption was I can't remember the character's name, but you know I'll say unwittingly Joey makes a big mistake, and you got a guy in a seat in an airplane reaching down to you know where you got the recline button but instead the button is labeled wings stay on wings fall off and he pushes you know where he pushes it down like the issue of the blasphemy of the holy spirit isn't a oh accidentally i hit the wings fall off button you know <laughs> that would really suck <laughs> uh dang it i didn't mean to and i you know i think that what chase said is the is the most reasonable interpretation of what that means um i you know it, it, and I, and I think one of the questions that's hard about that, and that I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm confident in, is does does God reach that point with a person during their life, or is it possible for anyone to repent? I mean, a, I don't know the answer to that question, but 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 one of the things that makes me wonder, you know, I think it's Peter, First Peter, where it says that you know God's not willing that any should perish, but He's patient mm-hmm. with all of us, and and. You know, I look at that and I just think, you know, that would seem to imply to me that there is, God doesn't write any of us off. But, you know, I don't know. I I, I think you've, Jesus is saying something to the Pharisees there and, and, and I, you can't just dismiss it. I mean, and trying to understand what, what it is that he was talking about is, uh, it's, it's a good question. And I, I think that Shay's answer is as good an answer as we could have. Yeah. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna do one more question from the book, then we'll wrap it up with a, a question unrelated that I'm curious what you guys think. But I will say for parents who may be going to Disney World with their kids in the car, this is where you may want to turn it off because some heavy stuff here. But one of the questions in the book: Why did Lot offer up his daughters to be gang raped? Why did God allow Lot's daughters to later have sex with their father? I mean, my personal opinion, if I could just throw it in there real quick, is that Lot was just really messed up with how he viewed sex, and it was a very, very horrible mistake on his part. Now, I also understand the cultural implications of how that's, that whole narrative would sound a lot different in that time than it would now, but still, I would not budge on lot was really messed up there he shouldn't have done either one what do y'all think because this is another question in the book yeah Uh, questions of why did god allow something to happen i mean god allows human beings to commit all sorts of acts of atrocious wickedness so i don't know that this should surprise us but the way it describes Lot elsewhere, like I think there's a passage that refers to him as righteous Lot, and um, Abraham is when he's in the previous chapter when he's praying to God. Well, what if there was only ten righteous people? He's doing the math in his head. It's like, well, okay, Lot, his wife, his daughter. So he's assuming that R- Lot is a righteous man. It shows you Lot living in a city that's known for wickedness. How much that can even twist and pervert someone who otherwise was a, a righteous man. So the first part of it. Um, the men of the town banging down the door want to gang rape the um, men who are actually angels in disguise who would come to visit Lot. I mean, Lot says, oh, here, let me send out my two um, unwed daughters for you to rape us instead. That to us is just like so completely, um, what in the world is going on? And I, you hinted on it, Joey, with the cultural thing that somehow in that culture, um, 
allowing your own daughters to be attacked would be less of a wickedness than the guests who'd come into your home. I don't, I, I don't understand that, but um, I, I don't know what Lot should have done in that situation, but I don't think that was the, the right choice at all. And then later, um, Lot's wife is is gets killed in Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, so Lot and his two daughters are living in a, a cave together, and evidently the daughters are getting pretty impatient. They're like, how long are we living in this cave? Um, we're never going to find husbands. So they decide to get their father drunk, and then when he's drunk, evidently passed out to the point that he had no idea what was going on. They had sex with him, and then they both have sons through their father. So I think like, I, like you described it, Joey, that Lot was pretty messed up. He was uh, he was doing these things, allowing these things to happen. So this is, in no sense, a description of what God wants or God desires, but it's a picture of what happens when you allow yourself to be surrounded by those who are influencing you wrongly, who are pulling you towards wickedness rather than righteousness. That even someone who was otherwise, Scripture calls him a righteous man, could so fall short of that because of um, what he'd surrounded himself with. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, to me, the story of Lot, in that sense, it, it, it kind of runs in a straight line to the passages in the law that just say, look, you've got to separate yourselves from the people of that area. You know, you can't, you, you, you know, and, and, and the separation has to be complete. And, and it's getting at that kind of an issue, like their culture will corrupt you if you allow yourself to live within it. Um, you know, as you said, I mean, it's, and, 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 you know, we, obviously we've got to be careful about saying, you know, making value judgments, one culture versus another in one sense. But I do think, is it acceptable to say that some cultures are, are, are achieve a closer approximation to what is right and true and good than others? I think you have to say the answer to that is yes. You've got to be careful about saying that about your own culture because you know that you've got blind spots, but but the truth, too, is I think that any righteous person is going to be influenced by the culture that they live in. There are, the, the issue is there are going to be assumptions that that culture makes about what is right and good that most people will never examine. And so can a righteous person be doing things that are, you know, uh, wrong in an objective sense because they live in a cultural context where those things are the accepted thing. Yes. I mean, could, would you argue that there were no believers, no Christians in the South before the Civil War? No one would argue that. And yet, how many of, you know, did you have believers who were slave owners? We can't really comprehend how that can be the case, but they had a culture where that was accepted and justified. And though they may have known God and followed God, they also had some mistaken beliefs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Well said. All right. So in, in real time, and I love being a part of this church because we are, we can just be super open about discussions like this, but we've been doing this podcast for, I guess, a couple of years now. And in the past we have, it, we brought on uh, a well-renowned atheist, Bart Ehrman, We've had a series on the miracle outbreak here at Seacoast that we experienced in 2019, 2020. It was a four or five parter. We ended the series with Jack here, who you've heard from, and an atheist discussing the miracles from a scientific slash faith perspective. And I think we've had one other episode of, of someone who used to believe and, and doesn't believe anymore. And we've got 87 episodes. So it's, it's not a majority of what we talk about by any means, but there are some leaders here at Seacoast that very much so applaud uh, that sort of approach of, uh, you know, all voices to the table and let's just discuss things and have some good conversation with people that don't believe the same. But there's also, there has been some pushback saying that we need to be, way more careful with who we bring to the table because of folks that may be younger in their faith. And, um, you know, like, for example, the the healing series that we did on this podcast, it was like all this faith and, you know, stuff that's, 
people that you and I know, and we're hearing these stories. So at least from our perspective, we're like, these people are telling the truth. These are friends of ours, man. God is really doing some crazy stuff. But then we end that series with allowing some skepticism into the conversation. Do you guys think, how, how do y'all, how do y'all receive that sort of pushback as far as people being a little uneasy with what sort of message we're sending to people who could be in a weaker place in their faith? Yeah, no right answer there. I, you know, no right or wrong answer. I mean, I, part of me feels like it's more like the, you know, parental guidance warning on a film. You know, <laughs> uh, you know there and and because I think the pushback that you're getting from a lot of these folks are not that these aren't good questions and they're not worth asking, but that there are some who are maybe vulnerable in their faith whose faith could be shaken before it really has a chance to take root, perhaps. And um, I'm sensitive to that. Yeah, and yet, me too. I get the pushback for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, and and I think I think then the thing is, do you have any point where you're trying to affirm what the church believes to be true? I I think we try to balance that without presuming that we're defining what the answer, the true answer is for the discussion. Otherwise, why did we have the discussion in the first place? So. I don't know. I, I don't know that there's a right answer, but I think you know both vo- both both voices are important. In the it's important to ask questions. It's important not to um, create obstacles for the you know our brothers and sisters who are weaker in their faith. Yeah. And, and how we strike that balance is something we're just trying to figure out day by day. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I agree. It's a tough one to. There's no real right or wrong. And I I think my my initial reaction to that pushback was, but they're going to encounter these questions at some point anyway. So why not encounter them with your church family? So like, for example, the conversation that we had that was, gosh, we we had, uh, yeah, the conversation with Bart Ehrman, we did a whole episode before people even listened to that Mm -hmm. with with you, Chip, Julie, so we could talk as a church family, hey, here's what you're going to hear next week, and here's some of our thoughts on it. So we took it serious. Uh, but I think that's a win. Hey, you, you get to be exposed to tough questions with your church family and you get to hear how your church family, uh, addresses them. But what do you, what do you think, Shay? Yeah. So we've got a podcast at gotquestions.org as well. And we've struggled with the same issues. Some of the guests we've had on and you get some probably similar to some people in your church who you should never have anyone on who doesn't agree with you. Like, 99.999% 99.999% of the time. And it's like, well, that would eliminate <laughs> the vast majority of the body of Christ. Um, so we've, I mean, we've never had like someone like a Bart Ehrman on, although I, I would actually thoroughly enjoy doing that. But yeah, I would have to be very careful in explaining, look, um, this person we're having on has very different beliefs. But yeah, wouldn't you rather have them exposed to someone like Bart Ehrman, in part of a conversation with someone that you know and trust, someone who can counter some of his arguments, someone who can present the other perspective. So uh, we're um, we're open to having guests who disagree with us on non-essential matters, and then but we're just, just very careful in like, even the questions we ask and the follow-ups that we do, just to clarify um, where differences of belief may be. But it's also just helpful to, for believers to see Christians disagreeing agree agreeably um to be able to have even a strong disagreement with someone but still treat that person with love and respect so i think uh, that's a healthy balance but no i i agree with jack that i don't know there's a right answer on how to do this is takes wisdom takes discernment um and thankfully god gives those things to us when we ask yeah well shay thanks so much is the po- is the podcast called the gut questions podcast is that what people is, search yes. all right the it's gut question on all the the major podcasting platforms and also on our YouTube channel. All right, sweet. And then what's the best way for people to get the book? Just go to Amazon or is it better to go to your website or what? Yeah, so uh, the probably the best price you're going to find is probably going to be on Amazon or christianbook.com, but if it should also be available at Books a Million and Barnes and & Noble. And you may see it in um, some actual physical Christian bookstores, although I know those are an endangered species these days. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, for our listeners' sake, we will have some copies of the book at our, at our Seacoast bookstore. If you're hearing this uh, next 
the, the next Sunday that you're at the Long Point campus, you can go to the bookstore and buy that. If for some reason they don't have it, then either I could not get that done or they were sold out. So, hey, Shay, thank you so much for your time. Very much so appreciated. Again, congratulations on all of this uh, fertile ground that God's been doing through you. So thanks for sharing your time. Uh, Joey, Jack, thank you for having me. I truly enjoyed our conversation today. Awesome. Yeah, Yeah, we did too. Thanks, Shay. You've been listening to the Things You Won't Hear on Sunday Seacoast Podcast. In the show notes, you'll see a link to our Facebook group page. Also, we'd love for you to consider subscribing so you get these episodes downloaded right when they come out. Thanks so much for listening.